For the first time in my life, I realized that there was something more important to me than God, and that was truth. And for the first time in my life, I learned that if I had to choose between God and truth, I would choose truth. Before, I had placed God and truth on the same level, as if they were equals. But I now began to realize that truth was necessarily a greater good than God, because it was possible for God not to exist, but it was not possible for truth not to exist. And this made truth God's master and ultimate judge. The state of the truth determined whether God even existed. If God's existence did not match the state of truth, then the entire concept of God was worthless. It would simply fall into the graveyard of false ideas. The truth itself would carry on. Truth did not need God to function. Its potential to transform and shape the world held its own power. But what was the truth about God? Theism defines God as both the creator of the universe and an intervening force in that universe. It also defines God as personal, meaning that God is a person, a being, separate from the universe he created. Having faced my fear of losing God and survived it, I allowed myself, for the first time in my life, to really look at the concept and ask, is this true? Do I really believe this? Given what I know about the world and this definition of God, does this even make sense? And the answer was a resounding no. It didn't. For one, if this being were roaming around the universe, breaking its natural laws, then why did it create those laws in the first place? Further, there just seemed to be no room for this being in existence. Every job that this being was supposed to do appeared to already be fulfilled by some fully explainable natural process. Every step science took forward seemed to leave less and less room for this invasive supernatural being. And this didn't only apply to science, it applied to my everyday life. In order to connect with this supernatural being, I had to actively disconnect from the natural world around me, which, ironically, was the only existence I could verify with my own eyes. This is what it meant for me, as a theistic Christian, to be holy, to not be of the flesh, to not be worldly. It meant disconnecting from the world, and ultimately, I now felt, disconnecting from reality. It had made me feel psychologically unhealthy, and I now realized it had probably contributed to my recent failure in statistics. This was because instead of studying the book in front of me, or asking someone else for help, I disconnected myself from the natural world that books and people existed in, in order to seek help from a supernatural being. And so, I concluded, I did not believe in this theistic supernatural being anymore. But when I thought about it, there was another way that I had interacted with what I had called God that did not involve disconnecting with reality through rituals like prayer. In fact, in this second way of interacting with God, I fully embraced reality. I embraced every heartbeat, every glance into the eyes of another person, every breath, every thought, and every ray of sunlight. And when I saw these things, I felt like I was literally seeing God face to face. Not a creation of God, not a symbol of God, but the ineffable reality of God itself. This was what I felt was meant by the verse, God is love. This God was not only compatible with the natural world, this God was nature itself. This God was the ultimate form of unity. It was literally everything. This God was not a being. This God was beyond being. This was a God I could believe in. I didn't know it at the time, but this conception of God is called pantheism. Formally, pantheism is the belief that God is the transcendent reality of which the material universe and human beings are a part. I perceive this God in the form of interactions between the natural world and human psychology as the true source of my numinous experiences. In fact, the more I contrasted this God with the God of theism, the more I despised theism for preventing me from seeing this greater form of God. After conceptually separating the theistic Christian God away from this new and more pure form of God, I was able to see how ugly it was. 
This theistic God was a dark force that demanded to be glorified. It demanded its will with an ironclad fist. It had been built and fed over the years by the Christian imagination. They heaped their greatest fears and most bigoted opinions upon it until it took on a life of its own. This God sent homosexuals to hell because it detested their actions. You are not worthy of Him. Your understanding is inferior and your logic is flawed. So He is your only redemption. And you damn well better believe every word in the Bible, whether you like it or not, because those words are His. If you didn't, He would fan the flames of hell in preparation for you. He had given you a chance. He had stated very clearly that Jesus was the only way. But you wouldn't listen. His will was divine. His guidance was perfect and perfectly clear. If you didn't know His guidance, it was your fault. You had to fix your sinful life. You had to separate yourself from the world through prayer and beg for forgiveness of that sin. Because you are pitiful and so unworthy and so lost without Him. And it was in this God that I saw the last bastion of hell. It became my mission to rid it from humanity. I realized that I had given it life. It had been like a program running in the background of my mind. I had fed and animated this God throughout my entire life. It had no reality of its own, only what I gave it. It was truly nothing. And as soon as I cut off its supply, it began to die. It was me. I had been expressing what I imagined to be the divine will. I had been emulating God. Now I wish I could tell you that after making this fairly lucid observation about the traditional theistic Christian concept of God, that I moved on rationally from there to greater purposes and higher forms of learning. But that would not be the truth, because that is not what happened, at least not initially. I was convinced that this God was Satan, and that Satan was nothing, literally nothing, completely insubstantial, able to create nothing on its own, or even to exist on its own. And this false god had clothed itself in the majesty of the real god. And if I had the power to stop it, then that made me Jesus. That's right. For four very interesting days, I thought I was literally the second coming of Jesus Christ. I began to reinterpret Revelation, which I apparently still felt had some kind of authority, despite the fact that I no longer believed the Bible was completely true. The beast was the god of the Old Testament, the theistic god in its most terrible form. The false prophet had been Moses. People had mistaken Revelation completely. Our actual spot in the prophecy was near the end. The devil was ready to be chained and banished, his manifestation as the theistic god ready to be unveiled, revealing his true insubstantiality, his ultimate nothingness, at which point he would fade from existence removing the barrier between humanity and the transcendent reality of heaven, which existed fully in the natural world. And the man riding on the horse, the one whose name was known only to himself, that was me. I would never tell a soul of my identity. I would only guide humanity past the barrier in our transcendence and allow heaven to be my guide. Eventually, I emailed the professor about some of my ideas. I never told him that I thought I was the Messiah but apparently he was able to infer it from the type of language I was using. In response, he gave me a long list of people over the centuries who, just like me, had thought they were the second coming of Jesus Christ. The length of this list, and the similarity of their ideas and plans to my own, sobered me very quickly. So, I probably wasn't the incarnation of Jesus Christ. In my defense, this all happened almost immediately after my deconversion which itself occurred in a jarringly brief amount of time. So maybe some insanity was unavoidable. But after moving past that deeply embarrassing detour from rational thinking, I was still very compelled by my new vision of a non-theistic God. Ironically, my first steps out of theism were my first steps into theology and a deeper search for the true nature of God 